Good morning. We want to welcome you to Aurelia Community Church this morning. We're really glad that you're here to worship with us. And uh, we want to um, start off our service with a time of worship. And I'm going to read to you some verses from um, the book that, or the letter that Paul <clears throat> wrote to the Philippians. And he's talking about Jesus here. He says, God elevated him, or Jesus, to the highest, the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that's what we want to do this morning. We want to declare that he is Lord. And um, we're looking forward to that day when everybody needs, bows before him. Um, but this morning we want to we want to declare that he is Lord. And we'd ask that you would uh, stand with us as we sing. <clears throat>
Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing Your name is life Break every stronghold Shine through the shadows Burn like a fire Depression, addiction, fear, anxiety, fatigue, or illness. Lord, we just ask that your name would come down on us like a, a, a healing bomb that would just cover us. We thank you that there's healing and there's life in your name. We thank you that um, there's no other name but the name of Jesus where every knee will bow and everyone will confess that you are Lord and that will happen someday. And Lord, we look forward to that day. But for now, we want to look to your name and we just speak your name because we know that there is power in your name. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. We want to prepare our hearts for communion and <clears throat> we invite you to stand with us as we sing about the love that God had for our world. So stand with us, please. to the 
escape your addictions Come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting there with open arms For God so loved the world that he gave us His one and only Son to save us His one and only Son to save for God so Bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. Thank you. you may be seated. So glad you're all here today. You know, I like to have fun when I'm up here, you know, chatting away and cutting jokes and, and all that. But uh, communion to me is the most serious thing that we can do in the time of worship together. Making sure that everybody have one that, uh, that needs one, that wants one. We're all good? Okay, just making sure. If you don't, hands up, all right? Oops, oops, oh my goodness. That's a little embarrassing, but hey, life happens. Oh, great. <sighs> iPad, Sean, use your iPad. Anyway, it's all good. Anyway, I'm still, I'm, still, I'm still working on that, right? One of these days I'll use all electronics, but oh my goodness. No, we tend to, gloss over this. And, and, and I say like, hey, if you want to participate in, 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 in this with us today, uh, that's great. But if you don't want to, that's okay too. You know, sometimes we're dealing with things. Sometimes we're, we're going through issues. Sometimes we're going through problems that, that are on our minds, that are, that are like on our hearts. And, 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 you know, and scripture's pretty clear. Jesus tells us like, hey, right, don't worry about this right now. Right? Go and deal with the issue with your brother or your sister. Then come back. Like it's okay. Right? Rather have, uh, God wants our full focus and intention on this. This is a serious thing that we, that we think about, right? Like, 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 like Catholics, right? Catholics, what is, what's the word? Transubstitution. Right, like they, 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 they believe that through, through communion, that this is the physical body and blood of Jesus. They take this seriousness to like, like next level. 
And so I, I just want to remind us today, right? We would not be here if it wasn't for this. There is no reason that we would be coming together if it wasn't for this. Everything revolves around the cross. Everything revolves around the sacrifice that was made. The body broken and the, and the blood shed for us. You know, I, I, I know we have these cups and they're, and they're not the, the greatest things in the world, right? I, I get that. But it's, but it's not the cup it's, and it's not the wafer. It's what it symbolizes and it's that sacrifice made. Like, like I know we'll get to like a time when we'll pass things out or people will come up and pick up, right? But until then, it's good to remember. It's good to remind ourselves of where we were prior to knowing Christ and where we are now and ultimately where we are going. The more that we do that, the greater our hearts will be and the better we will be able to share God's love to those in our community. Friends, we're going to take this together. So, like, I, I know people give, like, detailed instructions. Like, there's, like, the first layer is the wafer, and the second layer is the juice. And, and we'll take them both, like, at, at the same time. And we'll keep this very simple. I'm going to share a couple of scriptures with you today, and then we can partake. And then afterwards, I'll... I'll close in, in prayer. But as you're listening to these scriptures, I just, just be reminded of God's heart today. I know, I know we read John 3.16 and, and it's like one of those things that we just go through the motions on, but, 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 but for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would receive him would not perish but have everlasting life. What a privilege. We don't deserve it. But he did it for us. John chapter 6, verses 53 to 58 says that the Jesus said to him, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. And whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. And just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, and your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26 says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, broken, and said, This is my body, for which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, and do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, friends, let us partake. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for what Christ did on that cross. We thank you, Jesus, for your body broken, your blood shed. You did it for us. Us being here is a 
testimony to that fact. And, and, and we can't even start to begin to say thank you for what you did. We were all judged, but you received the punishment. And so we say thank you for what you've done for us. Let us always be mindful of that. And let's, let's never forget that or, or push that to the side that, that we are here because of that sacrifice. That we are here because of that cross. Let it be ingrained in our hearts and in our minds uh, so much so that we pass it down this, this love and this joy to the next generation and the generation thereafter. We thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And we pray for continued blessings as we worship with you now through your word. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, it's been a real honor and a privilege to be here to, to serve uh, all of you over these last n number of weeks. Uh, you know, I, I, got, I got a few weeks left till Pastor Mike comes back. So if, if you want to connect or have coffee or anything like that, feel free to uh, give, a, give a shout out to the church, call the church office. We'd love to, we'd love to chat with you. Uh, I, I, I love connecting with the, with the church family and, 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 it's a, and, it, and it's a blessing and an honor to do so. And, and as you uh, find out a uh, bit about me, you find out that like uh, I'm not really like there's certain things I like in this world, certain things I don't, right? Like there's certain hobbies that I have, certain things that just like eh, like whatever, right? Could could use it, could not. Uh, one of, one of the things that I, I'm not really is an art person. Like I'm not really like you wouldn't find me at like the gallery or the museum, right? I'm just not that, I'm not that guy. I'd rather watch a college football game and then spend my time in an art gallery or, or, or a museum, right? Like to, like to me, uh, this is art. We can get that. See, that's art to me, right? And, 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 and oh yeah, well, let's talk about, well, this is Jacksonville State, but like yesterday, right? Like my, my team, Liberty, they beat BYU, right? 42 to 14. You know, it's the greatest thing ever, right? That means that God loves the evangelicals more than the Mormons. That's all I'm saying, right? That's, that's proven fact right there. And now next, next, uh, now the next mountain to climb will be Notre Dame as they take on the Catholics in a couple of years' time. But, but until that, it, it, it's a great, great day. Like, that's art, that's art to me. But, but there's times when I've appreciated certain pieces of art. That art that makes you stop in your tracks and make you ponder about your place in the world as one reflects on the relationship with God and with one another. You know, one of the works of art is by a person by the name of Timothy, Timothy Schmaltz. You might have seen this, right? He's a, he's a Canadian sculptor uh, who lives in St. Jacobs, Ontario. Timothy does a lot of faith-orientated art. He, he, but, but there's one piece that has caught the attention of the entire world. You know, the first installation of this sculpture was in front of a, um, or a, a church in the United States of what we would call an Anglican, but it's like Episcopalian. Yeah, that's the word, uh, Episcopalian church. Uh, and, and so we would call that, we would consider that the Anglican church here uh, in North, Car North Carolina. And there's one in Toronto as well. And it's installed on a park bench in front of a church and it's of a homeless man sleeping with a blanket over his body and his head. But if you look closely, sticking out from the bottom of the blanket, the, the two feet bear the scars of nails. It's a statue of homeless Jesus. And this statue of homeless Jesus has, has drawn different responses from people. Several churches around the world have refused to have one installed in front of their front doors. Some people wrote to the local newspaper talking about how offensive it was and it demeans the Son of God. One woman even called the cops on homeless Jesus. 
while others have appreciated it. And for me, this statue embodies the text that we are looking at today. In a short number of verses in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46, we see Jesus in different ways refer to himself as king and then as someone who is, for lack of a better term, down on their luck. And whether he appears, Jesus appears in strength or weakness, Jesus always evokes a response. Just like this sculpture, there is no such thing as a weak, neutral feeling about Jesus. And of all the passions or passages that can stir our passions, this one can stir up our hearts the most. Jesus, as the ultimate judge, as seen in our text, reveals the judge in each of us. Through the brokenness of the world, our, our hearts draw us closer to Jesus and Christ to us. The more we are hearing the promptings of the Spirit, the more we are called to love those in our community and ministering true justice in the name of Christ. So the question for us today is how can Christ love and judge simultaneously? Well, we're going to spend some time looking at these words of Christ and see how Jesus meets us and how we meet him in judgment. And so, friends, look at our text today from Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. It says this, When the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And before him he will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people from another as the shepherd, or shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. And then the king will say to those on the right, Come, uh, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of this world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. And I was, pris I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in person and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did to one of the least of my brothers, you did it to me. And then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And they will also answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. That's a nice light verse passage, right? It's pretty easy going. Let's unpack this a little bit. One of the things you have to remember when dealing and reading with the book of Matthew is that it was written through the power of the Holy Spirit by a Jew to Jewish Christians and Jewish community from a Jewish worldview to answer Jewish questions. And I think this can't be stressed enough. Right When we approach a text like this, there is a whole world of thought and stories and, and images and, and language that, that lives just underneath the surface of these words that we read today, uh, based on the author, the context, and the audience. If we miss them, then we miss the whole point of this passage. So the Jews at the time when Matthew was written were living under Roman rule. We kind of know that, right? Like That's Sunday School 101. Right? I'd hope, if, if you ever go to Sunday school or OCC kids, like if you go, like, you know, if you answer one of these four things, like God, Jesus, heaven, pray, you got pretty much like 85% of all the questions down pat, right? Especially for the kids, but that's another, that's another story. Like in their history, 
They had a brief time when they ruled their own land, but then uh, that was ruined when they were taken into exile from the Babylonians. And since then, they returned to the land, but they were still controlled by other powers. And so in a real way, the Jews were still feeling the sting of exile. And as a result of all this displacement, what they were longing for was the anointed one. They were waiting for the Messiah to come and bring judgment to all of those who stood against the promises that he had made to his people. They believed that this person would bring in the age of the Messiah where God's kingdom ruled and reigned on earth with God's people flourishing within it. And a very important thing to point out, we tend to look at judgment uh, as something that's final, right? Finished, complete. But for the Jews, judgment was not the end of the world. It was the beginning of the world as it was promised by God to be. In their mind, judgment was the climax of history, not the end of it. And so at this point in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's in the last week of his life, and he spent time arguing with the Jewish leaders that he is, in fact, the Messiah, and so that God was indeed bringing in the age of the Messiah, but the chief priests rejected him. And so he spends all of Matthew 24 and this one talking about his judgment against Jerusalem and against the leaders. And this was offensive to the Jewish leaders, like you would think, right? Like, you know, somebody telling you how things are going to be. And they're like, well, we don't like this. And so and so that's one of the reasons they wanted Jesus gone. And so they spent their whole lives believing that God would bring judgment uh, against all of those that stood against the promises of God's people. But here's the kicker. This is what Jesus was saying, was that those Jewish leaders themselves, were, were they were the ones that were holding back the promises of God. They would be receiving the judgment, especially in the destruction of their temple by the Romans. God's promises were not meant to revolve around the Israelites, but to go through them to the whole world so that the whole world could be blessed. However, the the leaders made it their relationship with God. It was all about their own religious identity. And, and, And so we see how Jesus declares judgment. But before we get to God's judgment, we have to see Christ's heart within it. You know, after pleading with the Jews' rejection, right before Jesus launches into this apocalyptic tirade of judgment, he cries out for Jerusalem at the end of uh, chapter 23. He does so with love and with longing and with sadness. In the harshest words we have from Jesus here, there there is still an ache and a love for, for this world and for this people. You know, in this passage, we see Jesus show himself as king, and he declares that this judgment is universal. I think it should be said that that it's not the same as punishment, right? Judgment is not the same as punishment, right? We could be found guilty, but my punishment might be different than yours. Right? It's God's response to sin, to brokenness and injustice. And so all the people will face judgment. It's universal. Not just those people or those hypocrites or or those nationalities or those religions. We will all stand before the throne of grace and face judgment. Jesus intends for all the nations, not just Israel, not just the church, to receive all that judgment brings. Judgment is not just the act of an angry judge, but of a king who is committed to his promise and care for his world and for his people. And we see in the scriptures that judgment is always accompanied by the idea of revealing, right? Making known what is hidden. The Greek word for revealing is the word uh, apocalyptos, right? This is, this is, of course, where we get the word apocalypse from. And Pastor Mike talked about this extensively when he was doing the series of the uh, book of Revelation just uh, during the summer there. So I would encourage you to go check that back out. Your judgment and, and revealing are kind of one and the same, right? And this is where the real terror of judgment is. Right? Because for some, the, the revealing is surprisingly bad news, and yet for others, it's the most profound, shocking, life-giving good news. But what about all the stuff in this text about clothing and visiting and 
feeding and pr prison and stuff. Well, you with me so far? You following all this? Picking up what I'm putting down? Okay. It's going to get rough from here. All right, sorry. But it's going to be fun. All right. I think how we respond to these pictures that Jesus is painting are an expression of how we trust God and, and, and how God responds to us. And that in, in this world, our own poverty, we respond to it in our own poverty and in our own lack. How we respond to those in need is a, is a diagnostic. It's kind of like a litmus test to, for, for, to, to see how our heart really is and, and what we really believe about God. In other words, at the start of this passage, right, how we deal with others kind of reveals our own sheepness or our own goatness. Right? The, the real question that comes from this text is, is, is not how many nice things that you can do for people in need, but it's who do you trust that God is when he approaches you in your poverty, in your need? How do you feel and respond when, and when faced with those in material, uh, physical, legal, and spiritual poverty? And what might this say about your relationship with God? And, and there are many ways that we can respond to the needs of others. But the, questioning, the question lingering to us today is what do we do? And so first, friends, we need to see that the vision, that this vision that Jesus shares with us is for our good. Judgment is not meant to stir up fear, but to invite us to a greater sense of life. Jesus shares that oppression and injustice and indifference and are disfiguring to our humanity. And he gives us a way out, a way to move forward, a way to love our neighbors as ourselves. And I don't think the main point is to go out and start doing a bunch of good things, although that's good. And we should be doing that sort of things. But I don't think that's the main point of what we're looking at today. Like, look, as individuals and collectively as the church, I believe that as we move forward, the first step is to de detect and identify what is in our hearts. See how you respond to the cries of the world, the cries of those around Aurelia, and really dig in to see what that says about you and what is revealed by God's judgment. Then dive deeply into your relationship with God, asking yourself who, who God is to you as you relate to your needs and to your poverty. And then from there, as you move forward, I believe the next step is to dedicate yourselves to his people and to his vision of this world. You know, over the last um, number of weeks, uh, I've been able to see this church from a great vantage point. Not many people have the opportunity to come in for a few weeks and just like, you know, kind of get a 30,000 bird's eye view of what's happening, right? To see what you want as a church, right? The, this, and this community as you move forward in ministry. Now, I'm going to say what I'm about to say, because in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be out of that role. Pastor Mike's going to come in, right? And I'm saying what I'm saying to you today out of love. You know, like my family's here. We're all here. We're part of the OCC family. And so here's what I see. Firstly, I want to say thank you because I've appreciated the love shown to our family uh, since we've been coming here, like we came here about several months ago. You've welcomed us with open arms, but not just us. I've seen it time and time again, like anybody who walks through those doors is looked at and recognized as a child of God and is loved and is respected as such. It's amazing. I appreciate it each and every time. But friends, you gotta do something for me. Because I've heard it a number of times from a number of people over these last number of weeks. 
you got to stop dwelling on the past. More specifically, March of 2020, when the whole world shut down because of like this uh, coronavirus, you know, COVID-19, right? I get it. More people were at church at OCC prior to March of 2020 than there is today. But guess what? The vast majority of churches in Canada have experienced the same thing that you have. Some good, some better, some worse. And I get that as the church has opened more, some people have not come back. Some haven't come back due to medical reasons. Some have uh, been blessed online, and that's great. Others have moved. Others have disappeared, while others have gone to be with the Lord. And friends, I would encourage you to start, keep, or continue relations with those who haven't been here in a while. Like, don't leave it up for someone else to do. Right? Pick up the phone. Go to their house. Let them know that they are needed. Let them know that they are, are, are loved, that they are missed. Right? Don't wait for the pastor to do it. God could be calling you right now to be the pastor of those who people who are not here. In this moment. In this time. And if more come back to a really community church out of that in the next number of months, well then fantastic. But if not, that's okay too. Because if the church is to move ahead, then the mission needs to move forward. There, look, there are thousands and thousands of people within this community that need to hear the name of Jesus possibly for the first time. And you could be the ones who are called to do just that. Look, over, over the... Over the next number of months, I really want you to step out of your comfort zone. I'm, I'm coming out of this in love, right? I'm not trying to put you down. I'm not trying to, but church, you got to move forward. And I'm not saying you can't, like, you, you, I'm not saying not to be safe, right? Or, or, or take precautions. I'm not saying that, right? Like, do what you have to do. Right? But for the last number of weeks or, or next number of weeks and months, I really want to encourage you, step out of your comfort zones a little to see what God has in store for you and this church. Right? Detect or identify what, what your heart is for Aurelia. Dive deep into your relationship with God. And, and then when God has something placed onto your heart, dedicate yourselves to that as you reach out in love. And the other thing I need you to do is not worry about what the other churches are doing. Don't worry about them. Don't worry about how big they are or the programs they provide. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a number of big churches out there, and, and they can do some fantastic things in the community. Fantastic. Great for them. Bless them. Continue to do so. But I believe, and look, I believe Aurelia Community Church is uniquely positioned to be a blessing in this community and the surrounding areas in a way that some people and some other churches cannot be. Bottom line. And I'll tell you why. Because one of the ways, if you know that you are a healthy church or not, or are getting healthier, is by answering this question. If a bulldozer came tomorrow and leveled the church to the ground, would the community miss it? I'm not talking about the people that attend. Sure, they're going to miss it. Of course. That goes without saying. But would the community miss it? If the answer is no, you're in a bad spot. But if the answer is yes, then God has even greater things for you and for this church. And I believe this community would miss this church on many levels. OCC is positioned to move God's mission forward in Aurelia. To love those that God has placed in front of you so that they can experience how valuable they are in his eyes. What a blessing and an honor that is to be called on that way. And the good news is that you don't need to do 20 big scale things and ministries to be a great blessing. All you need to do is focus on one or two things and do it very well. 
When you do, you will see great things happen for God and his kingdom in this year and to the next. I'm saying that today because I love you. I want you to succeed. I want you to move forward. We've all been dealing with COVID for two years, but now it's time to make a step. Pastor Mike's coming in a couple of weeks' time. Start preparing your hearts now. Ask God just, what can I do? The more you do, I believe the more collectively and individually we will be able to share God's love impactfully, not just in the downtown core, but all throughout the community. I should be wrapping up this message or else I'm going to have like another sermon. So (laughs) this right here, I, I want to share this with you. Now, growing up, some of you might know what this is, right? Some of you might know, some of you might not. This is the church calendar. Growing up Catholic, this is like ingrained in my brain. Like this, this thing, like when I went to, I served the Pentecostal church and they're like, what, what's this? And I'm like, well, there's a church calendar and that's why we, reasons we have Easter where we do and, and Christmas is on this day and da, 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 da. And we, you know, and, and, and they're like, oh, I never knew that. Yeah, but this is like, this is ingrained in in my brain it's it, it, it still is like every week when we would attend mass right and, and anglicans do this well um lutherans um some presbyterians uh and, and united as well um when we would attend mass the first thing on the uh, bulletin would be the uh, date but then where we were in the timeline of the church calendar now on the church calendar, the last Sunday of the year, right before Advent, it's not, it's not, not on that, that picture, but, but it's known as the Day of Fulfillment. And by the way, in case you didn't know, that will be November 20th this year, right? And so I won't be here that Sunday, so let me be the first to wish you a Happy New Year. And so when we think of fulfillment... We may think of completion, a promise that is made, a promise that is kept, a a job that is started, has now finished. And when we think about God's plan for salvation, we see that God has fulfilled his promise to the people of old by sending his son Jesus to be the savior of all. In the life, death, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus, many Old Testament promises were fulfilled. In fact, throughout the scriptures, one sees that God fulfills his promises. He has in the past and he will in the future. And to those who put their faith in Jesus now, God promises an abundant life, a life to the full. He promises a heavenly home. He promises uh, eternal life. He promises answers to prayer and answers to deliverance. He promises us the gifts of the Spirit and growth and, and, and fruitfulness. He promises us his protective care, his guidance, his hope, his peace, his joy. He promises us an inheritance with all the saints. And he promises to strengthen us to do his service. And he also promises us rest. The, the list of promises goes on and on, and God will fulfill his promises to us. And in this, through Christ, we see the greatest mystery of judgment, the greatest hope, and the greatest news and promise to us weary, wounded travelers of life, and that is that judgment is our salvation. By dying, he took himself into the full weight of the evil, injustice, and wrong in the world. He received the punishment, not us. In his resurrection, he conquered it and dealt the death blow to death itself. And that is why he is found in the depths of human need and and in brokenness. He has tasted it all, even to our deepest place of weakness and poverty, death itself, and he has conquered it. And that's why there are those in this community who need to hear about God's love today. And they need to hear it through you, and they need to hear it through me. And they need to hear it through Aurelia Community Church. And so, really, community church, ask yourselves, 
Are you prepared to be the very presence of Christ in the neighborhoods of this city? In the communities of Oro, Romero, Severin, and other surrounding areas? As you move forward, may you also meet the very presence of Christ in those same places, continuing to persevere in the day of judgment, your salvation and your love of God in this community. There is a great opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus to those in this city, to those who are hurting, to those who need love. All we need to do is step out in faith and say, here I am, use me. Let's pray. Amazing God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the honor and privilege it is to come into your house to worship you. We thank you for everything that has gone on in the last number of years, the, the fantastic volunteers, those who have been praying behind the scenes to keep us safe and, and secure during times of pandemic. But I feel, Lord, sometimes during that time, we've gotten a bit complacent. And so, Lord, we pray that we would move forward from that. That we would once again raise up the mantle. That we would step out in faith, move out of our comfort zones, love those in our community, to be the hands and feet to Christ, to those who need your love in real impactful ways. We thank you for the opportunity to do so. And the privilege that this church has to do just that. We thank you for the wonderful love that this church has with with each other and with others. And so we pray that that would continue in a tenfold way. We also think of those who are not here right now. We're thankful for those who are, but we also think of those who have been missed. And so let us be their pastor in this moment so that they know that they are loved and they are missed and that we would love to see them again soon. We thank you for this day once again in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. We want to close with a, a song that's really like a hymn um, that reminds us of the death and the um, resurrection of Christ, that he died and he bled, he bled and he died to save us. And he did that to bring us freedom so that we could be with him for all eternity. And um, so would you stand with us as we sing?
need a chat I'll be here after the service today but as we leave here today be remindful that the God who went before the Israelites in the wilderness goes before you today so go in peace to love and serve the Lord to the best of your abilities with the gifts that God has entrusted to you and do so in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit this day forevermore amen Amen. Have a great day, friends. Be blessed.